Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Jonathan Shelley from Steadfast Baptist Church, and I wanted to make a video today to explain our eviction situation in detail, just to make it clear what's actually been going on. Now, some people may be confused as to why I would make a video like this, but there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of lies that have been said about our church, and a lot of people are confused about our church or, or what's been happening. And so I just want to make it abundantly clear what's actually been happening and how we've been treated throughout this process, because a lot of people want to demonize our church um, and our church family, but our church is some of the most loving, kind-hearted, generous people that I've ever met in my entire life. And we have been severely maligned and mistreated in this process. And I just want to expose that today with a lot of clear evidence of what the true motives are and what's been happening to our church. Now, again, Steadfast Baptist Church is a Baptist church. We're independent, fundamental. Um, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God literally. We believe salvation's by faith. It's a free gift. And, and that's our main purpose is to go out and preach the gospel and try to get people saved. But the church also is going to meet regularly, have uh, services where we preach through the Bible. And I, I preach uh, from Genesis Revelation. We do Bible studies every single week on Wednesday nights. In fact, I preach four sermons every single week, uh, and I, they're usually about an hour-long sermon each. So there's a lot of preaching out there. We try to put everything online just so that anybody that wants to hear anything about our church can find it. In fact, we also have a very detailed doctrinal statement that we put on our website that's always been there. It hasn't changed. And so we try to be very upfront and honest about who we are and what we believe and, and we believe the Bible, and we're not ashamed of believing the Bible. Now, in this video, I'm going to call out a lot of different people and, and make it clear what they've done to us. And some people would be uh, mad about the fact that I would call someone's name out, but the Bible has a lot of names in it. And a lot of the uh, ministers, prophets, and evangelists and apostles called people out by name. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, the Apostle Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. The Apostle John calls out diatrophies in Third John. The Bible has the Apostle Paul calling out people like uh, Hermogenes and Phygelus. The Bible has the Lord Jesus Christ giving instructions to John in the book of Revelation, who ends up calling out a woman, Jezebel, by name. And Sometimes it's important to just expose what people are really doing and what people are really like. Jesus called a lot of people out for being hypocrites, um, for putting forth a, a public image that's not accurate as far as what they do in private. And so my goal in this video is just to clearly just illustrate the facts of what's happened to us in this eviction situation, just so people can have a better understanding and maybe they don't judge us based on what some news article may say, but rather just on some cold hard facts. Now. I'm going to kind of try and start at the beginning and, and then kind of go through a timeline of a general timeline, a rough timeline of what's happened to us. But in 2020, we signed a lease with a company called Fellowship of the Sword, and its owner is Richard Henderson. Uh, I believe there are there's other owners potentially or other board members involved in this, but he is the primary uh, owner or the face of the company. And this company is a parachurch ministry that does spiritual retreats. Um, their information online is very vague as far as what they actually do or what they what they teach or anything like that. But we signed a five-year lease with them to rent a space in Hearst. And the space was a distressed property. Um, it was in very rough condition. And what attracted me to the property was the fact that the landlord was going to give me a, a really attractive rental rate, a really low rental rate, because we'd have to put a lot of money into the property. And so we agreed that I would take the property as is with the fact that I'd have to put a lot of money into the property and that we would get a pretty attractive rental rate. And so that's what we did. We took several months. We didn't get to move in when we signed the lease. Um, we took several months just basically renovating and putting uh, tens of thousands of dollars. In fact, if you include all the labor materials, it's probably well over $100,000 worth of money that we had to put in this space. We had to hire architects to change the use of space. Um, we had to get a certificate of occupancy um, with the city of Hearst, which caused uh, us to have to have a lot of expensive remodeling. We added new bathrooms. Um, we updated the entire space. We painted the entire space. We redid the flooring. And we made the space very nice. This is a great property. Um, we love the location. And we were very excited about this location. Uh, we we're 
anticipating being here for you know five years and even our lease contract had a five-year extension so we anticipated we could be here for a very long time we designed the space specifically for our church and so we uh, were real excited it worked well and it was business as user for a long time now we did this in august of 2020 in june of 2021 uh, during what's considered Pride Month in our nation, I happen to be preaching through the book of Genesis. And our church just simply picks a book of the Bible and just does every single chapter every single week. And it just happened to be that I was going through Genesis 17, 18, and 19 during June. And so during those sermons, I preached a lot of statements that were uh, very clear from the Bible about homosexuality. And, and specifically, you know, our church believes that Leviticus 2013, which says, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. We believe that verse is true. We believe that God's law clearly condemns homosexuality and even puts a capital punishment on that, which is the death penalty. Now, in human history, that has been a law for thousands of years across all kinds of nations, countries, and areas. In fact, in America, that was the law of the land in the 1600s, 1700s, and in the 1800s, even well after the Declaration of Independence was signed and ratified. So this is not a minority view. In fact, it's been a prevailing view for a long period of history. It's only in recent modern times that these statutes and these laws have actually changed and, and really declined to the point where they're no longer enforceable. Um, the opposite is almost what the law is in America today. Some people are even unaware of the fact that there was, uh, according to the Texas Penal Code, criminal punishment for being a hom homosexual in the state of Texas all the way until 2003. So it wasn't until 2003 that uh, being a homosexual was finally no longer illegal in the state of Texas. Now, I was in high school at the time, and so uh, growing up and, and going to high school, I'd always been around um, people who believed that homosexuality was a crime and that it was illegal, and that's what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, just because the Supreme Court deemed that law unconstitutional due to the 14th Amendment, which was a technicality, does not mean that the Bible changed or the law of God changed. Even in Romans chapter number one, the Bible still articulates that men with men are worthy of death. And so our church has always believed that. It's always taught that. And in fact, on our website, we have a doctrinal statement that clearly says, even though society deems this acceptable and believes that it's okay, we still believe that it's wrong and the death penalty should be applied in that area. In the state of Texas, the death penalty, in fact, is enforced against certain types of homicide and against child molesters. And here's the thing. I believe that the Bible clearly teaches that those that are the LGBTQ are pedophiles in waiting, and they would love to harm and hurt children. And so, you know, for the better interest of society, they should be punished according to God's word, no more or no less. But regardless of my personal beliefs or, or personal opinions, we're talking about, in this context, a commercial lease. And the commercial lease we had signed with Fellowship of the Sword clearly indicates that we have the church uh, here for the purposes of being a church. You know, the, the use of property is a church. We are a Baptist church. And no, and in no way did I anticipate, believe, or would ever think that us actually having church services or preaching anything that we believe would somehow be in violation of the lease itself. Now, in June, when I was preaching through my series of Genesis, some people that don't like our church took snippets out of my sermon and posted them on other social media platforms, like TikTok specifically, to try and demonize our church and try to take what I said out of context and suggest that I'm advocating violence towards the LGBT community. Now, that is not true. I do not believe that we should ever be violent. In fact, I've preached very clearly that we should never be violent or take the law into our own hands. And as much as I would love the idea of America bringing back Leviticus 2013, you know, it's, it's really just a pipe dream. I have to wait till the millennial reign, okay? But I still think it's profitable to teach that, and I still think it's profitable to believe that and, and you know, 
to explain our position on that, even though understanding that we're going to have to deal with these type of people. So we should have the, the right doctrine, but then we want to have the right attitude and realize we're going to have to exist around these people and, and tolerate them. And here's the best way to tolerate them, ignore them. Ignore them. You don't want to rile them up. And, and people always throw out this idea of, well, but Jesus didn't stone the, the woman caught in adultery or the woman taken in adultery. That's true. He did not. Now, if you actually study the law, the only people that are allowed to throw the first stone are those that are eyewitnesses. Jesus was not an eyewitness. So there you go. That's not lawful for him to do, number one. Number two, it wasn't lawful for the Jews to stone anybody at that time because they were under Roman law and the Romans were not allowing them to execute the death penalty. Just like in America, we're under a pseudo-Roman law and we don't have biblical laws and Jesus and the Jews submitted themselves to those laws, meaning that we also submit ourselves to the law of the land and we don't try to take the law into our hands. We never will. We never have. Okay. In fact, I've made it abundantly clear to our church that no one from our church should have any interaction with these type of individuals. Now, of course, people want to take certain statements that I've made out of my sermons out of context and suggest that I'm advocating for violence. But everything that I've ever preached is always in the clear context of legal, lawful punishment for criminals, not anything more, not anything less. But of course, people want to twist what I said for their own purposes. And so these clips were uploaded. It went viral, so to speak, in the sense that millions of people had viewed uh, just a, a small snippet of one of my sermons. But again, like I said, I preach four times a week, every single week virtually. And to take just one minute of my preaching to used to your advantage is very misleading, it's very deceitful, and it's very misrepresentative of what we actually believe. But because of these videos going viral, protesters started showing up at our church, and they started uh, coming on, in, on 6 27 21 and there was a big protest at our church. I was actually out of town. I was scheduled to preach at another church, but when I came back that late, that late night and then woke up early in the morning, someone had thrown a brick through the window of our church. Now, we don't know exactly who that was. It was not during the time of the protest, so we can only speculate as to exactly who or, or when that happened. But we did catch it on a video recording, so we have clear video evidence of the person who did it, when they did it. Additionally, we have a strong idea of who that probably is, and uh, we gave all that information to the police, and I believe there is an investigation, but uh, no one has been arrested or no other information has been given to us at that time. But what was really interesting is that the same day, the first day there was ever protests against our church, a, one of the protesters made a video, and he made a comment about a fellow tenant at our building, Embrace Grace. Fun fact, the company, or the building next door, um, helps women who have just recently had children and it helps uh, support single mothers be able to like keep their children. They don't like each other very much. <laughs> and they said that Embrace Grace and us don't like each other, which I was kind of surprised why this protester would be saying something about some other tenant that really has nothing to do with our church. In fact, I had never spoken to Embrace Grace or their owner, Amy Ford, at any time. Nor did I have any feelings of animosity or resentment or I could, couldn't make a statement that I didn't like them because I didn't even know anything about them. I completely left them alone. And, and really, we'd had very minimal interaction, if any. And I do not uh, have any recollection of ever speaking to her or talking to her at that point in time. So... I really don't know where that was coming from, but it definitely made me suspicious of why he had information like that or why he was suggesting information like that. But immediately following this protest and the brick being thrown through our window, uh, I went to the church in that morning. I, I cleaned up the mess. And in the process of cleaning up this mess, though, a woman came and came to the front of our door, and it, it appeared that she worked for Embrace Grace. I didn't know who it was at the time. And she said, hey, what happened? And I said, oh, someone threw a brick through our window. And she said, well, you should stop preaching mean things. And I, 
I thought, I didn't even know what to say. I was just kind of taken aback. And I just said, well, I'm, I'm going to preach the Bible. And then she kind of walked away. And, and that was kind of it. I didn't, there was no real conversation that was just pretty much just, she said that I shouldn't preach mean things. It was over. So then uh, uh, maybe an hour or a little bit later, uh, a person comes up to our church and this young man says, hey, I noticed your church door window smashed this morning. I called the cops. That's why they showed up. And so we started discussing the details and he was telling me what he'd seen and what he'd noticed. And, and I was really interested in the information he had for us. He came specifically to talk to me. But after giving me all the relevant information about the uh, crime that had been committed against us, I basically just said, hey, do you go to church? He said, no. And so then I offered to give him an invite to our church. And I just said, hey, more important than going to church, though, is are you sure you're going to go to heaven? And I tried to take that as an opportunity to preach him the gospel. And he was very interested. He wanted to hear. And so I started preaching the gospel. Well, while I was preaching the gospel, uh, a couple ladies from the Embrace Grace suite were walking around the building as they do on a regular basis, just kind of a morning exercise routine. And they noticed I was talking to this individual and they walked around us. But then maybe the second or third time they came around, uh, they started eavesdropping on my conversation with this individual. And when they started eavesdropping on this conversation, I was clearly expounding on Romans 3.28, where the Bible says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And I was making it clear to this young man that salvation was a free gift, that it's just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And after this woman eavesdropped on her conversation, she interrupted and started yelling at me and started raising her voice and saying that I was a hate preacher and was trying to verbally assault me and trying to get this young man that came to talk to me away from me. And she did not care that I was preaching the gospel. I told that very clearly. I said, ma'am, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, what happened to our church or any of our other beliefs. I said, I'm just trying to explain to him salvation is a free gift. And, and she did not care. She continually over-talked me, was shaking her way, wagging her finger at me and, and getting in her face and saying a lot of horrible things about me that weren't true. Well, there was another lady that was there with her. And at the time, I didn't know who this was, but it was actually Amy Ford, the owner of Embrace Grace. And she eventually butted in the conversation and said to the other lady, said, oh, don't worry, don't bother this guy. He hates all women. And, you know, I've never met these ladies before in my life. I've never spoken to them outside of the the, the few minute conversation I had had with Amy just prior where she said I preached mean things. And so I didn't know where any of this was coming from, but that's a pure lie. I, I love women. I'm married to a woman. I love my wife. I love my daughters. Uh, I love my, my mother. I love all of the family members I have. I love the women in our church. And frankly speaking, that was just a railing accusation that was coming out of nowhere. And I was talking to this individual in front of my door of my suite we weren't bothering them or, or, or doing anything that was a harassment to them. They came and purposely harassed us and attacked me and were trying to stop this gentleman from hearing the gospel and want him to go away. They made it abundantly clear. They said, get away from this guy, leave. They're, they're trying to interrupt our business operations, which our operations is a church to preach the gospel to people. And they were trying to actively subvert this man from hearing the gospel and trying to get him away from me. And fortunately, praise the Lord, it didn't work. Because after they decided to finally walk away, the uh, man looked at me and he was still willing to hear the gospel. And I said, I apologize. I don't know, you know, th those ladies and uh, they're mad at me for something else. I don't know exactly what they're mad at me for. And he said, no problem. I just figured they're a bunch of Karens. And so I then was able to continue preaching the gospel and he got saved. He called upon the name of the Lord. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that day. And in fact, there's other witnesses that saw these ladies harassing us, the people that uh, fixed our door and repaired the window and said they couldn't understand why these women were uh, verbally assaulting me. And really, it, it's, it's now in hindsight, a lot of this makes sense why certain individuals like Kevin Day may have said statements like, oh, they don't like each other. I wasn't aware that that, you know, <laughs> they didn't like me and I didn't have any bad feelings towards them whatsoever. It was really a one way disliking. Um, and so after that incident, um, I ended up going to the Embrace Grace suite and tried to talk with Miss Ford and try to resolve whatever conflict was there because I don't want to be in conflict with my neighbors or have animosity towards one another. I wanted to have peace. 
But she refused to talk to me. Her husband was there, refused to let me talk to her or to try and resolve any kind of issue. And in fact, he just yelled at me and told me to get the hell out of there. We were just offering, you know, if we could, you know, either buy your lunch or, no, no. or send y'all something no. or, or just no, try to, you know, basically make peace with you guys as best as possible, make sure that you're not upset I, with anything that we could fix. Or, well, I mean, I mean, what you guys are doing is causing a major disturbance for us. Can you be specific as to like what you mean by that? Did you see what was out here this weekend? I mean, I didn't ask anybody to come oh, yeah, protest my church or something. You definitely asked for it. What you said was definitely asking for it. So, it was completely inappropriate. Okay. You don't, I mean, who does that? Why, why, are, you, why are you even here? Like I said, Y'all I, should I, go get I'm your not own, trying. You should go get your own building and get the hell out of here. You have no business being here. I'm just, look, sir, I'm not trying to be confrontational. If you don't want me here, I'll leave. Leave. And so, you know, even me trying to attempt at some kind of level of peace, these people were just already hook, line, and sinker against me and, and want nothing to do with our church. And, and I don't even know why exactly. That would be for them to explain why they disliked me. But there had been one other interaction that our church specifically had had with them, and it was prior to this. Um, and I... You know, I wasn't there, so the only thing I can base on is the testimony of my church member, and, and this church member is a very honest church member, but one of our church members uh, was out in the parking lot, noticed a person in the parking lot, didn't know if they were coming to our church or not, invited them to our church, and asked them if they wanted to hear the gospel. The lady agreed. After giving her the gospel for a few minutes, someone from the Embrace Grace suite came out, a lady did, and the lady interrupted their conversation, told them that the, the lady needed to come into their suite. And um, my church member said, well, she wanted to hear the gospel. Can, you know, do you want to hear, her? let me finish. And the lady had said yes. And then the employee interrupted again and said, no, she needs to come in now. And so my church member just said, okay. And, and then that was it. So there, there really wasn't, you know, much of an interaction from, from my perspective uh, I don't see it as being a big issue, but apparently it, it greatly offended the Embrace Grace people. And so after hearing about the incident, uh, what me and my employee did is we bought some pastries and delivered them to Embrace Grace and just said, sorry for any inconvenience. But, you know, from our perspective, we were disappointed that a, a person was interested in hearing how to be saved and was drug away in the middle of that conversation, even though they admitted that they were willing to hear it. Um, but Nevertheless, you know, I wasn't there, so I'm just basing this on the testimony of, of my um, uh, church member, but I believe it, it sounds very true what um, happened. But nevertheless, no matter what, we just tried to make peace, and that's really the only interactions I'd ever had. I'd never spoken to Miss Ford or, or to their employees. Um, we just simply dropped off a basket with a note. That was the only interaction I'd had prior to or coming to our door, telling me I preached mean things, interrupting me from preaching the gospel. And really the only two interactions that our church has had with these people has been them interrupting us preaching the gospel to people that were willing participants. Um, since then, she's sent letters to the landlord um, stating that we're causing her all kinds of problems and, and issues. But the, the reality is this is fabricated on a lot of false information about our church specifically. And I do want to address a few more things, and I'm kind of breaking from my timeline here just to make sure that it's coherent. But when it comes to Embrace Grace and Miss Ford, not only did she uh, have negative things to say about me in person, she said a lot of negative things about me online. So in fact, there was a protest group that was organized by these protesters called No Hate and Hurst. And she is a member of that protest group against us. So she has uh, been in that group. She's, she's made comments. Um, in fact, one of the protesters was trying to organize uh, some of the people in that group to go to her suite and help them with some kind of event they had. And then she communicated back with them, told them that they didn't need any more volunteers at this time, but thanks for thinking about them. Um, there's been other individuals who have said a lot of negative things about us online, and she's commented and coordinated with them and said, I can't believe this church has any congregants. 
Um, some of our posts that we've put on our Facebook page and other places, she's gone on and commented and, and made negative comments about us. Now, since then, she's deleted some of them, but we still have uh, some of the screenshots from her comments specifically about our church. And, you know, from my perspective, I try to leave them alone. I've, I don't go and comment on their uh, business page. I'm not commenting on Facebook, social media about them. Uh, they're the ones that have been publicly saying negative things about us and um, making it clear that they're strongly against us and, and suggesting that these protesters are somehow a nuisance to them. But I find it ironic that they find them a nuisance when they're protesting me, but they're not a nuisance when they're invited to help volunteer at their business. And to me, that seems very inconsistent. Either they're going to be a nuisance at all times, or they're not a nuisance. But I don't see how you can invite the same people that are, quote, protesting and a nuisance into your own suite and then claim that they're a nuisance harassing you. So I find that to be very inconsistent with the situation. It seems like uh, they don't have a negative relationship based on the comments that they've made about each other. Um, and, you know, I believe that Miss Ford is, is angry at, at statements that I've made suggesting that I'm uh, advocating violence towards anyone. But these people are very clearly the protesters against our church. Let me make this clear are advocating serious physical harm towards me and my family. I hope that your children are I hate you. I hope that you die. I hope that you rot in hell. You're a stupid bitch. I hope that your wife is raped. I hope that your wife gets a bullet to the head like she deserves, just like you deserve, just like your children deserve. Because if you're going to sit there and talk about LGBTQ, you deserve that. Jonathan Shelley, I hope that you rot in hell you stupid and you better hope that i don't fly to texas you dumb you you stupid you your family and your life you dumbass all of you guys can take a bullet to the head they've made statements about how they want me to die and my family to die and they want to kill me and and they they make it very clear very specific so if Mrs. Ford is just against people advocating for violence, I find it very hypocritical that she would support, praise, or be uh, in a group that is literally targeted against me, wanting to cause violence against me specifically, yet at the same time condemning me for supposedly advocating for violence, which again, I don't advocate for violence, and I do not believe anybody should ever be violent for any reason. So, you know, really, this is just uh, hypocrisy at its finest in the sense that she condemns me for, quote unquote, being hateful or being suggesting violence when this group that she is inviting into her suite is the ones that are actually advocating for violence against me and my church members and saying really the worst, you know, things you could imagine about me and my family and, and our church members and, and they've been uh, very vitriolic towards us. I know their group's called No Hate and Hearst, but it's easily one of the most hateful groups I've ever seen, uh, specifically towards me, uh, my family, my church members, and the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, all of these things. So I just want to make it abundantly clear that the interactions I've had with uh, Embrace Grace have been anything but graceful. They have never extended grace to me or any kind of empathy or shown any love. It has only been slander, lies, and, and hatred towards me and my church. And I find that very inconsistent with the name of their company, uh, what they claim to be in, in support of. Um, I had no bad feelings towards them because I thought they were helping women, you know, not uh, have an abortion, giving them alternatives. And I thought that was great. But I just want to make it abundantly clear that even to this point, I don't hold you know animosity or ill will towards these individuals. I just simply want to make it clear what they've done to us and you know ask them to please reevaluate their position. I don't see why it's acceptable for them to support or advocate for a group of people that want to commit violent acts towards me and my family that are trying to disrupt our business operations 
and want us to stop preaching the gospel to people that are willing to hear. Um, this seems very anti-Christian. It seems very unbiblical. And, you know, frankly, I'm just kind of horrified by their actions. But hopefully they can reevaluate and, and decide that uh, that's not the way that they want to behave themselves. Now, I want to go back to where the protests began. And the protests uh, were happening on a regular basis as far as almost every one of our church services. Um, they were coming out. And so I ended up getting a notice from our landlord saying that I had violated our lease. And in the document that they sent me, they claimed that I had caused violent protests to occur on the property. Now, here's the thing. I've never asked anybody to ever do anything to the property to harm it, harm it or hurt it in any way. And additionally, you know, this, this violent act, we don't know exactly who did it. Or, or when it happened, or, or what was the real cause, because it's still an open investigation. But they also stated that my violent words, I'm sorry, your violent and inciting words and behavior, while stated, while speaking to the Steadfast Baptist congregation, was a violation of the lease. And so they're claiming that just my simple preaching and teaching of the Bible is a violation of the lease, which to me, I don't understand how that can make sense when we are designated to be a church and to preach the Bible. Now, whether people like what we preach or not, you know, I didn't sign up for someone to evaluate our doctrine uh, or to decide what's acceptable in the Bible or not. That's for a church to decide. You know, a landlord is simply, uh, you know, responsible for the property and and what's going on with the building, not uh, telling businesses how to run their business or their business model. This is inappropriate and outside the boundaries of what a commercial lease would actually suggest or do. Now, the part of the lease that they're claiming that I'm a, a, in violation of is the fact that I'm causing a nuisance or, or offensive activity or I'm disrupting the other tenants' activities. But first of all, the, the protests themselves, that has nothing to do with me personally because I don't want the protests there and I'm not a protester nor did the protesters sign a commercial lease with the landlord. Now, if you allow protesters to be a nuisance for a commercial lease, that puts every business in jeopardy because anybody could protest any business for any reason at any time. And if that caused them to lose their business, you would actually encourage people to protest or commit crimes against someone. This is called heckler's veto from a legal term. And this is very dangerous litigation if you can have enemies of a particular business essentially shut it down by either committing crimes or harassing uh, patrons from that particular business. There's been a lot of cases where uh, this has been um, litigated, and in all those previous cases, it was found that a tenant cannot be in violation of the nuisance clause for protesters. Additionally, my speech... Uh, should be clearly covered within First Amendment protections. Um, and additionally, because our church is designated to be a church, it should be obvious that I'm going to preach sermons from the Bible. Now, the things that they are mad about came out later in evidence uh, of a trial against us. But at this point in time, it was just so vague, it wasn't even clear what they were articulating, just as simply suggesting that us preaching the Bible was a, somehow a violation of the lease. We did hire an attorney who responded. Um, after responding immediately, they never gave us another response for several days. Then when out of town, they sent me a second notice of default, suggesting that I needed to, number one, hire a, a private security company 24 hours a day and seven days a week to protect the building, and two, provide a plan to cease the nuisance. Well, Neither of those are found in the lease agreement whatsoever. Additionally, they gave me less than 24 hours to actually uh, satisfy these demands, which was a complete unreasonable requ request. And they threatened us by saying they were going to hire it themselves at $40 an hour, which depending on what month we're talking about, this could be anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000 that they're threatening to uh, use against us if we don't hire a private security company for perceived threats from these protesters. Now, the reason why this is being sent is because prior to this, right before, there was a, a big protest 
where the protesters were coming in the parking lot and screaming and yelling at our church members while they were simply just trying to exit and go to their homes. And it was really confusing to us why that was happening because the police had told us that the protesters weren't allowed to come and harass us in the parking lot. Now, this is extremely confusing to us because, according to the police, they're not allowed to come into the parking lot. But after talking with the police officers, and we have the video of this, the uh, police told us that the owner of the building had given the protesters access to the property. To them, a criminal trespass warning, and they have to... to and was making it difficult on the police to do their job and and causing you know our church uh you know a lot of harassment and and basically making it very difficult for us to even just enter and exit the building now a man by the name of jeff duncan who was saying that he was the maintenance worker for our building and was working with the landlord is the one that was giving this information to us and to the police officers and making it clear that, you know, these protesters have access to the property, they can use the bathrooms there and everything like this, making it to where these protesters can get all the way into our face and come up on the sidewalk if they want to. And so it was making a very uh, difficult situation for our church, not something that we wanted or whatever desire. And, and really, from my perspective, um, causing uh, a violation of lease to us in the sense that they're trying to cause harassment and making it difficult for us to even have our church services. Well, again, this was not something that we desired, wished, or wanted. Um, we were trying to work with the police, and the police were very pleased with our performance, but they felt very hamstrung by the access of the property given to these protesters. Subsequently, the police um, had talked with the owner of the building, and they had suggested signing some document that would make it where if we didn't want unwanted visitors, they would have to leave and make it a little bit easier for us to have our church service. The owner of the building did um, satisfy that demand. But in the letter that they sent us right after this, they said that the police suggested the 24-7 uh, security, armed security, and that, you know, that was something that we needed to do absolutely. So I contacted the police and I spoke with the primary detective and he made it abundantly clear that's not something they suggested. Now, I don't know that he's going to do this, but there was conversation that he might even hire a security guard for at night or during the week when we can't be there to protect the property. Is that a, is that a conversation that y'all had with them or is that? Well, that's one he brought up to me. Okay, so he brought that up to you guys. Yeah, you know, we didn't recommend, I mean, we don't recommend those things. You know, it's not something we bring up. Uh, but if somebody wants to do it, that's up to them. So that means that their letter sent to me was a complete lie. Uh, additionally, we sent correspondence in regards to this particular notice, asking for clarification on what they want as providing this detailed plan, considering the fact that the lease has nothing to, to do with that particular proposal, and they did not respond to us. So landlords become completely unresponsive, not talking to us. And from our perspective and from legal counsel, they said they're just doing the necessary documentation for the eviction trial. They're not uh, interested in actually working with you. And, and that was very clear. So shortly after this, the uh, building owner um, ended up contacting me and demanding an in-person meeting. Um, and he demanded on the day that my fifth daughter was born, um, which was very difficult for us. You know, I'm trying to deal with my wife and help her. She's postpartum. I, I ended up just uh, leaving the day after my, my fifth child was born to meet with him on, on such a, an extreme demand. And he basically just threatened me. He just threatened me and said, if you don't leave, I'm suing you. And I, I tried to explain to him why I didn't feel like we had violated the lease, but he didn't want to listen. He didn't want to hear and just for you to understand, you know, whenever someone has a, a nuisance or offensive clause in a, a lease contract, this is not carte blanche, anything that could be deemed offensive or nuisance. Otherwise, no one would ever sign a commercial lease. This has a very clear and defined context of an activity that's being done on the property and, and specifically outside of normal business use. So if our church was 
you know, screaming or yelling or, or having loud noises coming out from our church services that was truly interrupting um, our fellow tenants during their normal business hours, then that would be why we could be evicted for being offensive. You know, if a, if a weird smell or a weird sound, then that would be a violation of the lease. But during our church services, none of these other businesses are even open. The protesters themselves have nothing to do with us. We, they're private citizens on adjacent property peacefully protesting. So that has nothing to do with us and, and cannot be uh, attached to us. So therefore, we hadn't violated the lease. You know, I wasn't blasting my sermon through the walls or, or forcing any of these businesses to hear anything that I had ever preached or believed. They were purposely going online and finding clips and snippets of my preaching to be taken out of context to use against me. And that's not a violation of the lease. Um, because we'd put so much money into this property, leaving would have been a financial detriment to us on top of the fact that it'd be very difficult to find a new space, especially considering the fact that um, some of the more prolific leasing companies in this area had been alerted of this conflict and our landlord was communicating with the broker that brokered our deal. And so the, the leasing agent and broker um, were definitely alerted to the situation and the broker made comments to protesters online about us being a clown and um, that the landlord is aggressively seeking to evict us. What you're about to hear is a conversation that I had with a real estate broker who worked on behalf of the owner of the strip mall for the church in Hearst, Texas that they were renting out. Yeah, with, with his awful statements. Uh, and the opinions of this tenant are not uh, the opinions of this landlord. Um, and he is he is dealing with this aggressively. So, uh, but, I, but I can tell you emphatically, the, organ, the, the group that owns this building uh, does not share the same views and same hateful views that um, the tenant does. And they're dealing with it very swiftly. It's just gonna seem like we're not dealing, he's not dealing with it swiftly because the legal process takes time. And unfortunately, these two other uh, Christian organization nonprofits get lumped into this clown. I mean, the moment that the innovation from the owner is it's a pending legal matter, he is aware and he is aggressively seeking legal ways to get this guy out of there. The one thing I need to communicate that I hope gets out there is they're unanimously every single tenant has had discussions with the owner and they do not agree with these views. Additionally, uh, this caused me even more issues, I believe, down the road because when looking for other properties, I contacted a completely different leasing agency and the leasing agent was Jake Burns of Structure Commercial and he ended up showing me a property. I looked at it, I texted him and then he sent me a text out of the blue calling my wife fat and, and suggesting that I was a false prophet and telling me to shove the Bible up my you-know-what. And really, it, it just seemed like my name was just being smeared everywhere based on just simply believing the Bible. This individual obviously doesn't have any respect for the Bible. Who in their right mind would have any respect for the Bible would tell someone to you know, shove it up their rear or, or, or say such wicked things about the Word of God? regardless of how you feel about me. And so, you know, from our perspective, even if we wanted to leave, there wasn't an obvious place to go. The landlord suggested that they would try to work with us if we found a space somewhere else. But at the same time, you know, you can't just uproot a, a business and find another commercial space in, in a very short period of time. And the landlord is only giving me a week to even do that, which... Again, we hadn't violated our lease and we'd spent all this money and we had an attractive rent rate, which from my perspective was going to only benefit the landlord because the landlord would benefit from all the tenant improvements we put in the property, which again is almost over $100,000. Um, the rental rates in our area had dramatically increased and inflation was, was escalating. So he could probably charge double or triple for this space that we're using right now if he decided to get another tenant. And so from my perspective... Um, you know, is a very uh, grievous situation. Um, we sought legal counsel and, and, you know, our lawyers told us, look, this is a clear cut case where, you know, you haven't violated the terms of the lease. Churches have the freedom to, to preach what the Bible says. 
And, and that makes perfect sense to me or any reasonable person. But again, because people are trying to twist what I've said or suggest I'm saying things that I didn't, that's being used as a pretext to uh, call me a hate preacher or, or vilify me and my church. But it's very clear that what's happening is there's just a lot of religious discrimination against us and, and our church. Now, I wanted to uh, address some of the online situation. During these protests and during these situations, the um, man by the name of Jeff Duncan, who was identified as a maintenance worker who uh, had association with the building owner, he made all kinds of online posts negative about our church, inviting people to protest our church. He would show up and give water and, and food to the protesters. And from my perspective, I don't understand how I'm encouraging protesters to come to the property. And the maintenance worker, Jeff Duncan, is not because he's clearly inviting them, encouraging them, giving them water and food. I don't see how that can be used against me that the protesters are showing up when tenants uh, are encouraging and supporting them or in their groups, fellow tenants, when the maintenance worker is encouraging them, inviting them there. And in fact, even the landlord's own son is making comments. Uh, Riley Henderson was making comments online suggesting that he wanted to protest our church if he was in the area. Um, so I, I don't understand how the landlord's son and and associates and fellow tenants um, uh, encouraging these people to be there, wanting to be there, protesting us, is somehow me encouraging them to be there. Not only that, Jeff Duncan um, is the one that was communicating with the police, telling them that the building owner was giving them access to the property. I asked Mr. Henderson if he had communicated to the protesters through Jeff Duncan, and he admitted that, yes, he had communicated through Jeff Duncan to the protesters. Did you give messages to Jeff Duncan to give to the protesters at any point in time? No. So then why would he give lots of messages to protesters on your behalf saying that you gave him that message? Because... Is he lying again? I because Jeff is Jeff. But I'm just saying, so that would be a lie. I don't know. Would it be a lie if Jeff said that you gave him messages to give to the protesters? Messages to give to the protesters. I'm not even going to comment on that. Okay. Because anything I say, you're going to twist. But here's, how am I twisting anything? So I'm, I'm asking you, you straightforward questions. I'm gonna, I, I did send a message to the protesters. And this is what I said. Wait, wait. I'm going to answer your question. I did give a message for Jeff to send to the protesters. And it was this. We love you guys because we love all people. Because Jesus is love. There's the deal. We don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to do. But I, but we love you guys. And please don't burn my building down. We love you guys. Please don't spray the building with bullets. We love you guys. Please don't suck the other tenants into this act you've got to grind here. And I did that. Absolutely did. And I would do it again. Um... And we have a lot of evidence of, of all their interactions. In fact, the protesters themselves had made comments online saying that the building owner had come and contacted them and talked with them. Um, then uh, because we were being uh, sued, not just our church, but me even personally, we had a hearing and a trial where they presented evidence uh, against us and we got an adverse ruling. Now, in this hearing, the owner, Mr. Henderson, testified under oath, under penalty of perjury, that the protesters are not protesting other groups. They don't, they're don't. they not protesting Jesus. They are only protesting me. But that is very clearly false. The, the people that have been protesting me, let me make it abundantly clear, are open Satanists, witches, uh, people that identify themselves as uh, atheist, sodomite, just almost anything and everything that's very anti-biblical and very satanic, they are associating themselves with. In fact, many of their signs say, praise Satan, hail Satan, you need Satan. Pentagrams drawn everywhere, um, all over. They put the seven tenets of Satanism near our building. So these group of individuals, uh, do not like the Bible. They have said very derogatory and negative statements about the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them are so blasphemous and so horrific, I don't even want to repeat them. 
But a, a couple of them, I'll just, I just want to give you a little sample. They said things like, your magical sky daddy hates you. They said, you know, F you, Jonathan. They said, God is non-binary. Um, they say, y'all make Satan look good. They say the King James Bible is a mistranslation. They say um, things like Jesus had two dads, which is so blasphemous and wicked. Um, they say, you know, things about sodomy and, and all kinds of grotesque pictures. And they say that they're proud reprobates. And so it's very clear that these people despise the Bible, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, not just Jonathan Shelley, not just Steadfast Baptist Church. In fact, in their groups, they've even said that they want to protest people like Greg Abbott and other Christians. And so this group is not just solely against me or something that I said. They're against everything that our church believes and stands for. They're against everything that the Bible preaches and stands for. And, and these people uh, are, are giant hypocrites because they claim to have no hatred yet they very clearly hate me. They very clearly hate our church. And our church members have had zero interactions with them because they don't know them, they've never talked to them, and they're just taking their family into church, yet these people are, are swearing at them, yelling at them, calling them the most evil things that you can imagine, intimidating their children, saying evil things about their children. And this is all being encouraged by Jeff Duncan. Jeff Duncan says that these people are, are doing a great work and, and they're wonderful, Immediately following our trial, the, uh, there was a message posted by Jeff Duncan. He congratulated this group of people, these, these people that are open Satanists, and said that um, when, we got ev- when we finally get evicted, that he wants to party with them in our suite. And I, I really just couldn't even believe it. How can a religious organization that claims to be Christian want to, want to party with open Satanists in a Baptist church after they've successfully evicted them. Um, this just really is just mind-boggling. In fact, uh, Jeff Duncan had put some strange posts online uh, showing that he kind of has a perverted view of the Scriptures, suggesting um, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter number 19, uh, I'll just kind of read what he said, but he said, uh, it's a story of rape of young, beautiful men. And then he also insinuates that what Lot did is not really an abomination after all when he committed incest with his own daughters. Now that's really just horrifying. I don't understand why anybody would believe that those things are what the Bible teaches. Um, Obviously, that's what happened, and, and the Bible contains history, but not everything that happened was right. There's obviously sinners in the Bible that commit horrible sins, and that's what was recorded but we have God's law to tell us what's right and wrong. And Jeff Duncan has a very strange, perverted view of the scriptures here. And and from my perspective, you know, that is typically the fruit of these parachurch ministries who have, you know, really forsaken church or or want nothing to do with church or they don't like churches. Um, And it's it's okay for people to not like me or, or not like my church. Everybody has their right to believe whatever they want. But it's not right to sign a contract, sign a lease with someone under the clear, obvious evidence that it's for the purpose of a Baptist church and then evict them for being a Baptist church, evict them for believing what the Bible actually says or preaching doctrine. Um, It's also a dangerous precedent that's now been set because we went to another hearing after we appealed this and the judge ruled with the landlord again and didn't give a detailed explanation, but essentially the only evidence that was presented is two clips of my preaching. Immediately following our trial, Jeff Duncan posted in the protest group against our church that they were successful in doing something that's never been done before in this country, which is evicting a church based on what they say, that the freedom of speech did not prevail, but rather churches can now be evicted based on what they preach or say. And what a sad day for America when churches can't even preach the Bible anymore. They can't preach what they are convicted or believe, but rather uh, we're going to let judges determine what is acceptable doctrine, what is the acceptable interpretation of the Bible or the appropriate applications of the Word of God and evaluate sermons of pastors. 
And again, they don't want to actually look at any of my preaching within context or, or ask me to explain my positions. They get to determine what I'm preaching, if it's right or if it's wrong. And whether people like what I preach or not is not really the big deal here. What's the big deal here is that our community is empowering an angry mob to essentially shut down any business that they don't like or disagree with. If they have an unpopular opinion, they can be shut down. And the precedent is being set. You know, there's Facebook groups like Resurrecting South Hearst, where this um, this group from the No Hate and Hearst is also members of. And, and they've tried to demonize us and say a lot of evil things about us and using platforms and groups like this to encourage the hatred towards our church, to help try to shut down our business, to affect uh, the financials of our church, and essentially suggesting that people cannot believe um, certain doctrines, uh, trying to, you know, uh, lie about them and deceive them. And, you know, from my perspective, you know, it's it's one thing to not like what I said, but why do they have to twist it into something that I didn't? Why do they have to um, put forth our church as an image that's not actually true? To me, it shows an ulterior motive. It shows someone that uh, does not have true intentions and, and someone that's not really on the side of the Bible. I don't know why people would want to coordinate and work with um, people that are open Satanists when they claim to be Christian, but that's for you to decide. In fact, in the most recent hearing and trial, two of these uh, obvious open protesters were scheduled to be witnesses in support of the landlord. So the landlord is, uh, you know, the attorney is contacting these people or, or working with these people. Um, the landlord admitted to me that he's contacted the, the protesters. The uh, maintenance worker has obviously been in contact with the protesters and sending messages to them, supporting them, praising them. Um, the fellow tenants, which is also another religious organization, is uh, supporting these open Satanists and the people that hate the Bible. And I would just ask the viewer, does it make sense for Christian organizations to partner up with and join hands with uh, open Satanists against a church, regardless of how you feel about that church? You know, that's just an interesting question that I would like to put out there. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, um, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Um, the Bible makes it clear that, you know, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You know, so the Bible's very clear on this issue, that you shouldn't join in or have fellowship with um, the, the evil works of darkness, but rather approve them, is what the Bible says. And the point of this video is to just illustrate what's actually been going on. This is, uh, in my view, in my personal opinion, is just a satanic attack against the Bible. And it makes sense because our church is doing so well. Um, people are very happy. We've been growing. Uh, we've been reaching a lot of people with the gospel. A lot of people have been baptized. And so I believe that the devil just wants our church to stop preaching the gospel and, and getting people saved. And, and they're trying to cherry pick the most extreme statements I've said, taken out of context, suggesting things that I don't actually believe to try and not just demonize me, but even any independent funnel Baptist or any Baptist or any other church that would actually preach the Bible. But I hope you, as a Christian, um, as, as someone that believes in liberty or freedom, would really consider this situation and, and evaluate, you know, where do you fall on this issue? You know, where do you fall on these lines? Do you think that it's, it's right for churches to be treated this way? And, um, you know, I don't know what the future beholds. I'm still um, hopeful that the Lord will bless us in this situation. And I'm not discouraged because the Bible says rejoice when men shall persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. And, and that's what's happened here. A lot of people have said a lot of horrible things about us that are just not true. And instead of actually... Um, putting forth what we actually believe, they have to put an alternative narrative so as to attack our church. But if you have any questions or if you uh, enjoyed this video, you need to share it with people because what's happening to us could happen to anybody. And, and let me warn Hearst, let me warn Texas, let me warn America that if you're going to empower this angry mob of 
of uh, people that hate God and, and hate the Bible to be able to throw out businesses that they don't like. Here's a question, who's next? And one of the people that's against us, that's her message. She attacked us, she said evil things about us, and then she said, who's next? Good luck finding another space now that everybody in Texas and America knows who you are. Who's next? And, and that's a scary message for those who uh, have an unpopular opinion. This could be Chick-fil-A, this could be Hobby Lobby, this could be any church down the street. This could be someone that has a gun shop. This could be someone who voted for Trump. This could be someone who did anything that could be sitting in the hot seat. And while you may not like me or agree with my opinions, uh, it's important that our country has the freedom to believe and, and preach the Bible so as we don't allow uh, the devil to shape the only appropriate narrative, the only appropriate church, the only appropriate doctrine. We need Holy Spirit filled men of God to stand up and to preach the Bible and, and to not to compromise and to believe that it's more important to stand on the truth of God's word than to compromise and allow these evil forces to rule your church. Well, I hope that this, this uh, video was a blessing unto you. Um, if you have any questions, you can always call or email our church and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please share this video, and uh, God bless you. Have a great day.